Hello everyone, my name is Ala Sayed. I'm a fifth year medical student at King Saud bin Abdulaziz University for Health Sciences. And today I'm going to talk about tracts. So before we start talking about tracts, let's start talking about neurons. Now, what are the parts of a neuron? Now, the neuron is actually divided into a cell body containing the nucleus and the organelles. Attached to that cell body are actually dendrites, taking the nerve stimulation from an adjacent neuron. And then you'll have an axon, which will carry that stimulation into the axon terminals to another neuron. Parts of a neuron. You have the cell bodies. They actually form the gray matter of the nervous system. Now, if those cell bodies were within the CNS, we call them a ganglia. And if in the periphery, we actually call the cell body a nuclei, they form a nuclei. So an important exception to this is actually the basal ganglia. It's within the CNS, but it is still called a ganglia. And now axons. Now axons form the white matter of the nervous system. So if the axons were within the CNS, we call them a tract. And if they were within the periphery, we call them nerves or sometimes you hear them as nerve fibers. Now moving to the main topic of this video, tracts. Now tracts are actually two types. You have ascending and descending. So think of ascending as a bunch of neurons taking a signal from your limb to your CNS. Let's take an example. So if you uh, touch something hot, how does this signal actually go from your hand to the CNS? It goes from your hand to the CNS by ascending tracks. So they're basically a bunch of neurons from your limb. Let's imagine it the hand in this example. When it touches your hot coffee. This signal is co uh, it's going from receptors and through neurons from your hand to your CNS or to your brain. And that's why you actually realize that the coffee is hot. Other sensations carried by ascending tracks include pain, they include vibration, they include pressure and other stuff. This is what descending tracks will actually help you do. So the signal will go from your motor cortex through those neurons and up to your limb, to your muscles. And you will move the muscle and you will touch a pen and you will write with the pen. This is a cross section of the spinal cord. Now the spinal cord is made up of gray and white matter. Now the gray matter compromises of the posterior horn as you can see here which is sensory. And you have the anterior horn which is motor and the intermediate horn at both sides which is autonomic. Now the rest of the structures are actually the white matter. Now the white matter is actually divided into three uh, columns. The dorsal column, the lateral, and the anterior column. Now what exactly are these? If you can see the posterior horns at each side, actually the thing in the middle is called the dorsal column. And between the exits of the motor neurons at each side, we have the anterior column. And the rest is actually called the lateral column. Let's recap. Tracks are divided into ascending and descending. Ascending are actually divided into the dorsal tract, moving in the dorsal column that we just explained, and something called the spinothalamic tract. Now, the spinothalamic tract has two tracts under it, one called the lateral spinothalamic tract and the other called the anterior spinothalamic tract. Now, they're called lateral and anterior based on where they run within the white columns. So, if they run within the lateral white column, they're called the lateral spinothalamic tract. And if they run within the anterior uh, white column, they're called the anterior spinothalamic tract. And in this video, we'll actually explain the dorsal tract. So the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway or tract, what is it responsible for carrying? You remember we mentioned a lot of sensations going to the CNS. So this tract actually carries four sensations. One is called the discriminative or fine touch. Now fine touch is actually when a needle touches your finger and you can actually pinpoint that specific area so it's very actually specific this is what we call fine touch it's also called a tactile sensation and you have also pressure carried by this tract and vibration and proprioception now what is proprioception i would like to think of proprioception as uh, share your location 
So if your friend tells you to share your location and you share it using WhatsApp, he can know exactly where you are. Now, it's the same thing with the brain. The brain needs to know where your limbs are located. So receptors within the tendons uh, of the joints will actually send this signal to the brain so that the brain will actually know where the arm is located and where the leg is located. So another thing about proprioception, proprioception is actually of two types. Some proprioception is under conscious control or uh, under awareness, and some is under the unconsciousness. So if it's under consciousness, this means that the signal from your limp is actually reaching the uh, cortex. And if it's under your unconsciousness, it's actually reach reaching the cerebellum. Let's explain it a bit more. If you actually walk, are you focusing where exactly is your leg? No, you're not. You're actually just walking and your legs are moving in a nice way. That's because of the act of your cerebellum. The cerebellum is constantly getting information from your uh, limbs about their location and fixing your movements accordingly. So you walk freely in a nice way. But if you suddenly decide to focus on your walking and decide to know where your leg is, this is where proprioception is reaching actually your cortex and uh, you're getting this awareness of your movement. Properties of this tract. First of all, it's really fast, so high conduction velocity. Why is that? Because it's carried by large diameter fibers. Those diameter fibers are large diameter fibers are actually called A beta fibers. And the second thing is that the sensor information actually reaches the cortex, which means that it is under your conscious awareness. And not only does it reach quickly, as we previously mentioned, it reaches with high resolution. Remember we mentioned the fine touch? So let's start explaining the tract. Let's take an example. Here's your leg, and someone actually touched your leg. So you have the sensory nerve ending here moving towards the spinal cord. So when someone touched your leg, that sensory receptor was stimulated. So the, uh, the axon moved... With, uh, until it reached the dorsal root ganglion, where the actually uh, the cell body of that first neuron lies. Now, the sensory neurons are actually pseudo unipolar neurons, as you can see here. So, from the receptor, the neuron moved, bypassed the cell body, and entered the posterior gray horn. And from the posterior gray horn, as you can see here, the actually the axon will move upwards within the dorsal column and hence the name that's why it's called the dorsal column median laminiscal pathway now as the axon is moving upwards it's actually called fasciculus cuneatus or fasciculus gracilis based on the origin now what is a fasciculus it's actually a bunch of nerve fibers now what do i mean based on the origin it's either called fasciculus cuneatus or fasciculus gracilis now if the nerve fiber came from the lower limb, it's called fasciculus gracilis. And if it actually came up from the upper limb, it's called fasciculus cuneatus. So, in other words, below T6, they're actually called fasciculus gracilis. And above T6, they're called fasciculus cuneatus. So, if the nerve fiber entered the spinal cord below this level, Gracilis above the level cuneatus. So I'll just draw something here. Bear with me. I have terrible drawing. Okay, let's imagine this is a spinal cord from the upper limb region. So as you can imagine here, if we can imagine a neuron coming from here, and it enters the uh, posterior gray horn. And from there, it goes to the posterior white column, as you can see here. So it's actually moving, if you can see, it's actually moving lateral to the one coming from the lower limb, as we saw here. This is the leg. It's moving more medially. And this is important in injury. So if the medial aspect was actually injured, you get loss of sensation from where? From the lower limb. But if the lateral aspect of this tract was injured, you actually use sensation from the upper limb. You can see it more clear in this picture. This is a dorsal column, and this is medially the fasciculus gracilis. So it's responsible for the lower limb, 
How do you remember that? Her graceful legs, okay? Graceful thin legs. And laterally, you have actually fasciculus cuneatus. Now, fasciculus cuneatus is responsible, as we said, for the upper now leg. Now that you understand the organization, let's go back to the tract. Now, from the nerve receptors, the signal moved up through the dorsal root ganglion and then through the uh, posterior gray horn and up to the dorsal column as fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. Now, as now, if you know from anatomy, you actually have the spinal cord, and after the spinal cord, you have the brainstem. The brainstem is made up of the medulla oblongata first, then you have the pons, and then the midbrain. So as the first neuron is actually moving up within the spinal cord, it reaches the end of its journey at the medulla oblongata, in which that neuron will actually synapse with another neuron. There are many second neurons because we have many axons. Now, those neurons are actually located within two nuclei, one called nucleus gracilis and the other called nucleus cuneatus within the medulla oblongata. Now, you were a nerve fiber coming from fasciculus cuneatus. You will actually sign up with a cell body with a nucleus cuneatus. And the same goes for fasciculus gracilis. It will sign up with something in the nucleus gracilis. Now, the neuron from the receptor and up to nucleus gracilis or cuneatus was called the first order neuron. And the neuron that starts after nucleus gracilis or cuneatus is actually called the second order neuron. Now the second order neuron will actually move to the other side as you can see here. Can you see it going to the other side? It will move to the other side at the level of medulla oblongata as something called the internal arcuate fibers. So now those fibers actually crossed the midline. They crossed over, they went to the other side. Okay, after they actually cross the midline or go to the other side, they will actually ascend up through the pons and then to the midbrain. As they ascend, they're called the medial laminiscus. Okay, and that's why the tract is actually called the dorsal column medial laminiscal pathway. So after they reach the midbrain, they will actually go to the thalamus. Now, the thalamus actually has two parts. Let's imagine this is a thalamus. Okay, it has a ventral part and a dorsal part. Now, the ventral part has three other nuclei the ventral anterior, then the ventral intermediate, and then the ventral posterior. The ventral posterior actually also has two parts ventral postural lateral and ventral postural medial. Now, all of these are actually nuclei. So what will happen here is that the medial laminiscus will actually go and that neuron in the medial laminiscus will go and synapse with the third order neuron located within the ventral postural lateral nuclei of the thalamus. From that nuclei in the thalamus, the third order neuron actually starts. Now, the third order neuron will actually enter a structure called the internal capsule as soon as it exits the thalamus. Now, the internal capsule is not actually shown within this diagram. I will draw it here. So, as you can imagine, it's something looks like this, that looks like this. Okay? So, it actually has two limbs, an anterior limb and a posterior limb. So as the neurons actually leave the ventral postulatural nuclei of the thalamus, they will actually go into the posterior limb of the internal capsule. When they go into the posterior limb of the internal capsule, you can imagine all that axons actually being stuffed into that limb. So you can imagine them coming up together or clumped together. As soon as they actually leave the posterior limb of the internal capsule, they actually radiate, they spread their wings, they're free again. So, so they go all around the cortex, creating this structure like a radiation. That's why they're actually called corona radiata. So as they exit the uh, posterior limb of the internal capsule, they will go to that sensory cortex as corona radiata. Now, in Latin, corona actually means a crown, and radiata because it actually radiates all over the sensory cortex.
and the post central gyrus. This is a repetition of what I just mentioned. So as you can see here, the lower limb here is moving more medially and the upper limb is more laterally. So this is a first order neuron moving up within the spinal cord and through the dorsal column. When it moves through the dorsal column, it's called fasciculus gracilis or cuneatus respectively, according to where they actually originated from. And then in the medulla oblongata, they synapse with the second order neuron in nucleus gracilis or cuneatus. And then the second order neuron is actually what crosses over what crosses the midline to the opposite side and moves within the brain stem until it reaches the thalamus. In the thalamus, it synapses with the third order neuron in the ventropostolateral nucleus. From there, nerve fibers of the third order neuron will go into the internal capsule, specifically into the posterior limb of the internal capsule, and then they will actually divert all around the cortex as corona radiata. Here's a p another picture of the internal capsule. As I mentioned, you have two limbs, an anterior limb and a posterior limb. As soon as the fibers go out of the posterior limb, as you can see here, they're radiating all around the sensory cortex. This is basically a summary of of all I mentioned in the video. This is another picture of the tract. Let's just summarize everything here. So this is a first order neuron. It has its cell body located within the spinal root ganglion. And then the axon from that cell body will move towards the gray uh, posterior horn and upwards towards the uh, dorsal column. When the uh, axons are actually moving within the dorsal column, they're called fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus. They will reach the medulla oblongata and sign out with the second order neuron within nucleus gracilis or nucleus cuneatus. Here, the axons will actually move at the level of the medulla oblongata and cross over, cross the midline to the other side as the internal arcuate fibers, those are the internal arcuate fibers, crossing the midline. After they reach the medulla oblongata, they exit the medulla oblongata upwards as the medial lemniscus. They go into the pons, midbrain, and then eventually reach the thalamus. In the thalamus, the second order neuron will actually meet the third order neuron in the ventropostolateral nucleus of the thalamus. Then the third order neuron will send its axons within the posterior limb of the internal capsule and from the internal capsule it reaches the cortex and eventually the information is analyzed in the sensory cortex. Thank you and if you have any questions, comments or suggestions contact this email.